Hey everybody and welcome to your very last lecture. We will be going over uh, chapter 34. This is going to be all about women's health, uh, preventative methods, pregnancy methods. We're going to go over hormones and all of it combined. This is a little bit of a longer lecture with 78 slides total, so this should hopefully take us an hour or less. Again, there's going to be a lot of information in here that you should already know from anatomy and physiology, maybe re-reviewing some of the anatomy portion of things um, and some of the terms that may be new to you in your book, because we're going to go over, I would say, the most important ones, again, trying to focus on the content that is the most necessary for you as a nurse, as well as for you in you know, succeeding in this class and moving forward to pharmacology too. So just a review really quickly on the female reproductive system, we have uh, sex steroid hormones that the females essentially give off, which are estrogen and progesterone. We'll kind of talk about how those come into play. We also have our pituitary gonadotropin hormones, which is the FSH follicle stimulating hormone, as well as our LH, our luteinizing hormone. So the female sex steroid hormones promote um, development of our primary and secondary sex characteristics. They also promote the start of our menses and the regulation of our menstruation cycle throughout our life. <clears throat> so what are estrogens? So there's actually three major, major types. There's estradiol, there's estrone, and then there's estriol. Estradiol um, is the most active of the three estrogens. Estrogens are synthesized from our cholesterol in our ovaries, and essentially they are the basic structure that we need for a steroid. Um, there are synthetic versions of these types of drugs, these estrogen types of drugs. Um, there's one, again, called the steroidal type. These are our estrogens that are essentially going to be given to us either transdermally, sometimes um, in creams. Uh, estrogen, women can put like an estrogen type cream um, and insert it vaginally. Um, estropropiate and many other types of estrogen drugs available. There are non-steroidal medications, um, diethylstilbestrol, and this one's actually no longer available in the uh, United States. Estrogen does a lot of things with our body. So primarily it is one of the um, hormones that function uh, mood behavior. Um, it actually helps contour certain development of our bodies and the shapes of our bodies. And it also develops and maintains the female reproductive system. We need to have estrogen present uh, for female sex. So these are common estrogenic drugs. I would say the ones that I've seen most commonly would be like Primarin or the Depo Estradiol, um, Estenil either. Those are all, those are all pretty common uh, medications that I've seen. The list does go on. There's a large group of medications we're going to be talking about tonight. I will try to point out what I think is either the most common that you'll see the most often or maybe ones that I've personally given before. There are many forms of estrogen or estrogenic drugs. Um, another one that comes to mind is this estradiol. So this is a vaginal cream. Um, it's typically given when you give treatments towards the end of your shift, depending on the time of the day or when the doctor has ordered it ordered this medication, but you want the patient to be laying down, um, maybe even with their legs up, you know, a little bit and their head down a little bit, just to kind of comfortably keep that the vaginal cream inside so that they're not, you know, leaking out. What happens often is we learn in anatomy that the, uh, the vaginas are self-cleaning, you know, they kind of tend to get rid of things that they don't need, or if there's too much cream or something involved, it doesn't get a chance to essentially seep in and work correctly. So you sometimes want to position the patient, um, you know, in, in the bed appropriately so that it has time to, you know, work itself in and perform what it's meant to do. So estrogen is not for everyone, obviously. If, uh, if a woman has a deficiency in estrogen, we can give this medication either topically, as I said, um, with a vag as a vaginal cream. We can give it in a patch method, and we can give it orally, which is like um, sometimes grouped with progesterone, depending on the type of medication, or excuse me, depending on the type of oral contraceptive it is, you can give it orally in like a birth control pill. It does help patients who suffer from uterine bleeding. It decreases the amounts of bleeding and it should regulate the menstruation cycle. It's also used to prevent osteoporosis from occurring. Um, a lot of women will take estrogen to decrease their hot flashes when they're perimenopausal or in menopause. 
Oftentimes you'll see estrogen given with a patient who is being treated for breast or prostate cancer as a palliative care treatment and for um, ovary, ovarian failure or castration, the removal of ovaries. You always want to make sure that you're checking your patients for any drug allergies. That would, of course, be a contraindication. Other contraindications would be estrogen-dependent cancer. You wouldn't want to give more estrogen if that cancer is going to thrive off of it and be able to multiply, right? If it's an undiagnosed ab um, abnormal um, vaginal bleeding, then you do not want to give estrogen because that could make it worse. You want to, you don't want to mask the problem. You want to treat it. Uh, of course, you would never want to give um, a birth control form with something like a pregnancy, right? Because you want to make sure that that fetus has a viable living environment instead of the uterus. Um, or if there's any kind of a thrombo thromboembolic um, disorder, you would want to hold off as well. So can estrogen give you any kind of side effects or adverse effects? Of course it can, just like any medication. The most serious would be blood clots or any kind of like a thrombolytic event. We want to make sure this is very common with, I've heard with the uh, neuvering, the vaginal neuvering. A lot of uh, women have gotten off of it because of blood clots. Um, some people have even died because of the medication. It's very serious. So um, you want to make sure you're going in at least every year for your pap smear, for your checks. And then every time you go in for refills, which is usually once every three months, depending on you know where you order your medications from, you want to make sure you're reporting any kind of new signs or symptoms or your patient is educated to report that. It has been known to increase hypertension, um, cause edema, and then your normal medication, you know, adverse effects such as your nausea, vomiting, um, you know, diarrhea, abdominal pain. It could cause photosensitivity, so you may need to watch out when you're out in the sun, extra sunblock, protecting your skin, making sure that, you know, you go out and you're covered. It could uh, cause amenorrhea or uh, breakthrough uterine bleeding. Now, some women do not want to have um, periods at all. Or they don't want to have any kind of a normal menstruation cycle. So there are typically certain kinds of contraceptives that can cause the woman to either skip the period for the month or um, not have one at all. And that's, you know, obviously a discussion for the patient and their healthcare provider to have. Um, so it may be normal for them to have, you know, amenorrhea, which is, again, not having a menstruation cycle or, or um, absence of menstruation. That's what the word means. <clears throat> uh, tender breasts, fluid retention, and headaches, which, which can oftentimes um, be correlated to maybe a false positive um, or some kind of a, a, you know, a hope for pregnancy. And so, again, we want to remind our patients if they're trying to get pregnant or if they're trying to conceive, obviously having estrogen products wouldn't be something that we would consider. Um, but again, the uh, tender breast, fluid retention, and headaches are normal, especially when taking medications like estrogen. So, again, the benefits, you know, with the risks, which is better? Is it causing more harm than good? If so, let's try something different, right? Alrighty. Interaction. So what interacts with estrogen? What is something we may want to educate our patients on if they're taking other medications or, or taking other types of, um, you know, herbal supplements or dietary supplements? So um, if a patient is on estrogen, it can actually decrease the use of their anticoagulants. So if you haven't noticed already, estrogen plays a big role with clotting factors, blood thinning, and things like that. So if your patient has any kind of a you know, bleeding disorder or has to take um, anticoagulants for whatever reason, they need to be very careful when selecting the birth control of their choice or estrogen type of um, you know, product of their choice. And of course, the physician should know this, but it could, again, decrease the use of oral uh, anticoagulants. Anticoagulants. It also could decrease the effects of rifampin. So depending on why they're taking rifampin, um, you know, it could be a prophylactic reason, whether it's for like something like latent TB or what have you. Your patient should again just be aware that if they're taking a medication um, such as rifampin, then they need to know that it can decrease its effect. Um, again, this is typically given for somebody who has like. Um, latent TB, so they're using this prophylactically so that the TB doesn't convert over to true TB, you know, tuberculosis case later on in life. St. John's wort, this is something that's typically seen over the counter in herbal uh, supplement. We want to make sure that they know that the, taking the two of them together can decrease its effects. Um, tricyclic antidepressant. So a lot of antidepressants actually correlate with other medications, and in this case, taking estrogen as a high-level hormone can um, 
can really enhance the antidepressant uh, factor, but we've also had reports that it enhances the adverse effects of these antidepressants and can make these patients feel more depressed, more down, unmotivated, lack of, you know, just drive to get up and, and have, you know, get ready for the day or have, uh, you know, a good quality of life. So it's very, very important that we speak about our mental health with our patients, ask them how they're doing, how they're feeling, if they've noticed any change, you know, any change in their behavior, um, motivation? How are their relationships with others? You know, do they have a significant other? How is that relationship going? Same with, you know, um, family members and friends, if the, their relationships have changed, and kind of just letting them know that, you know, there have been interactions that have been noted with this before, and they may want to consider some other types of estrogen products or non-estrogen products. Uh, patients who are smokers can decrease the uh, overall effectiveness of estrogen. So again, what is estrogen used for? Again, it's primarily used to, used to treat estrogen deficiencies, um, but they're also used on different levels for contraceptives, um, like we had said, to help treat some of those um, non-estrogen um, inhibiting cancers, but other cancers of such, right? Um, and we want to make sure that our patients, when they're taking these estrogen um, medications or products, that they report if it's therapeutically effective or not, um, because we can, you know, change their doses as well. It doesn't doesn't necessarily have to stay. There. There are recommendations to support the initiation of hormone replacement therapy, typically around the time of menopause or what we call perimenopause. Um, and this is given to those patients to treat some of those you know, symptoms when they're going through menopause, such as hot flashes and things like that. But do wanna point out that it's not used for the prevention of other disorders like osteoporosis or fractures. Um, Hormone replacement therapy is also not used for women with history of endometrial or breast cancer. Remember we said anything that kind of thrives off of estrogen, especially certain cancers that use that in their reproductive process, um, obviously it would be you know, contraindicated to give, it, give that patient more estrogen. Now we have progestins, and the commonly the most commonly used ones are things like Hylutin, Plan B, Depo-Provera, um, and then Prom Prometrium, which is progesterone, plain progesterone, and Implanon, which is actually an implant. So when patients are taking progestins, uh, what's happening in their body is that these um, secretions start to change in the endometrium it actually starts to increase the basal body temperature. Um, you'll, they'll notice a thickening of their vaginal-like mucus. The uterus starts to become really relaxed, the smooth muscle around it. Um, they have stimulation of their mammary alveolar tissue growth, um, and then they essentially start to release these pituitary gonadotropins. So patients may take this medication uh, due to maybe abnormal bleeding, and that bleeding could be caused from a hormone imbalance or from fibroids. This patient could have some type of a like uterine cancer um, or endometriosis. It is typically also treated um, for people who are experiencing amenorrhea, which we talked about, you know, lack of menstruation as well. This medication can be given alone or as a combo med with estrogen um, to essentially prevent conception of, of um, children, right? So birth control form. Um, it could also be uh, used as a prevention of a threatened miscarriage, um, and it does help alleviate some premenstrual uh, menstrual syndrome. So the contraindications of these medications are very similar to estrogens. The interact, uh, interactions can just be patient-to-patient -patient, uh, basis. Uh, adverse effects that we may see, we need to watch out for liver dysfunction, running lab work, making sure that the livers are functioning well. You'll see that there's also these, uh, you know, clotting factors, bleeding factor disorders that we need to worry about with any of these hormone type medications. Um, pulmonary embolisms are very dangerous and life threatening. Again, we want to make sure that the patient is coming in annually for their, um, you know, pap smears and their workup. And then we also want to make sure that the we're checking in, you know, quarterly or whenever we are seeing these patients to ask if they've had any changes in, you know, lifestyle settings. Are they noticing any, you know, red, painful areas um, such as like blood, uh, blood clots that they might be worried about? And we're just checking in with them again and making sure that there's nothing that's changed. Uh, they may notice nausea and vomiting when on these medications, um, either spotting or no um, menses at all, anuria. 
Sometimes they'll notice edema or weight gain or weight loss. Again, every patient is different, which is why we say it's just you know patient to patient and just case by case. So diving deep into some of these that you're gonna see more often, I will spend some more time on ones that I think that you will see more than others. This is one of them, this is Depo Provera. Essentially, this is mostly given as a shot, typically in a larger glute or in the leg muscle. Um, sometimes you'll notice that it's given in the deltoid, which is actually a common area for teens because it's just kind of awkward for them to you know, pull their pants down to give the injection, but they say that it is best actually given in a larger muscle like a leg or in the glute. What happens here is this medication when given and inhibits the secretion of those pituitary gonadotropins, which in turn basically prevent this you know, ovary from producing this matured egg and then going through the cycle of being prepared for um, you know, fertilization and then pregnancy. So when you're on the shot, you're trying to prevent pregnancy, right? So you're trying to prevent those things from occurring. Also, this might be given to people who are having uterine bleeding or nonstop bleeding um, issues with um, missed, you know, uh, cycles or skipped cycles, as well as lack of bleeding in general or lack of menstruation and amenorrhea. This is sometimes given for certain types of cancers, such as endometrial and renal cancer, um, but it is primarily known as a contra. So speaking of contraceptives, there are their own class. So contraceptive drugs, uh, again, medications just used to prevent pregnancy. There are uh, new medications that are coming out quite often, um, different types of forms. We have monophasic, biphasic, and triphasic forms. Uh, triphasic form is actually most closely duplicated to the regular you know, hormonal levels of the female cycle. So they say that that has the least side effects, but you know, we've, we've seen and heard a lot of patients who have had successful and unsuccessful um, stories with contraceptives, especially while um, on, let's say, a medica certain medication uh, like an antibiotic or something, it can render these contraceptives, um, it can make, it can decrease them, right, and vice versa. The, the contraceptive can decrease the antibiotic, and so in return, sometimes pa patients get pregnant, right, or maybe they misuse the medication, they don't take it every day, or they skip one, and then they can again get pregnant. Um, there is other types of contraceptive uh, contraceptives available. There are long-acting injectable forms. There is patches. There's the contraceptive ring, which again, this is one I told you that has a big link to um, blood clots. And then there's uh, implantable rods, right? So how most contraceptive drugs will work is it inhibits the release of certain hormones. Um, it also preps the uterus lining to have very thickened walls, which includes um, decreasing sperm uh, movement to be able to get there, obviously, which would decrease the fertilization of the egg and the sperm. Um, and then hopefully overall uh, with contraceptive, the goal is to inhibit a zygote from forming. There are other drug effects when using contraceptive drugs, um, and some of them are intentional, and some of them, you know, just happen with the, you know, the contraceptive or preventative method. So it can improve the menstrual cycle regularity by taking it. So you'll essentially know that the 28-day cycle will be put into place or try its best to be put into place. Um, it will decrease the blood loss during menstruation. It will decrease the incidence of functional ovarian cysts, and hopefully it will decrease ectopic pregnancies. Um, these medications, again, are indicated for prevention of pregnancy, but sometimes we do see it treating other things and it becoming more popular for other reasons. Uh, endometriosis is one of the main ones. Um, when given a contraceptive medication, medication um, it can also um, help the production of our withdrawal bleeding. So in between cycles can help, um, you know, decrease some of the withdrawal bleeding. And then um, it's also used as a post-coital emergency contraceptive. So some of the adverse effects that the patients may experience can be weight gain or weight loss unintentional, um, thromboembolisms, hypertension, um, all the way up to heart attack, stroke, um, serum hormone concentrations um, becoming increased. And then we've also seen um, edema, dizziness, you know, again, like I talked about the weight situation, depression was a major one, um, breast changes, diarrhea, vomiting, and nausea. 
So there's some contraindications, obviously, to contraceptive drugs would be unwanted pregnancy or pregnancy while taking these contraceptive medications. We've heard horror stories uh, where, you know, babies have been born and there's been like an IUD attached to them. Um, I actually learned in my RN program what would actually happen if a patient found out that they were pregnant and they still had their IUD in place. One of the common methods is actually to leave the IUD in place because it causes more harm trying to remove it than it does um, if it were to stay in utero or, um, you know, stay in while the baby is growing. So that is something that we've seen before. If there's a known drug allergy to either the contraceptive active ingredient or one of the ingredients that are inside of the contraceptives, if it's, say, something like a uh, oral contraceptive or a uh, topical contraceptive, we would want to make sure that we try to find maybe a different method for them um, that does not have that active ingredient. And then as we learned, and I just want to keep reiterating this today in our last lecture, uh, the known risk for all of the bleeding issues, so thromboembolytics, um, all the way up to, you know, of course, like I said, leading to heart attacks and strokes and things like that. So contraceptives can have many drug interactions. As you can see, um, I talked um, primarily about antibiotics in the last slide, or last few slides, um, but rifampin is on there again. Um, then another thing to take note of is the barbiturates and isonazid. But again, I want to reiterate the antibiotics and rifampin stand out to me a little bit more than others, specifically with antibiotics, because that is something that's a little bit more common. Nobody knows when they're going to get sick, right? We can't predict when the next sinus infection or episode of bronchitis or UTI comes along. So we really have to make sure that these patients are using backup methods, that they understand the importance of, um, you know, during taking the antibiotics, that they are either refraining from sexual activity or they have a second method of birth control as the birth control can kind of be less effective, right? Um, other drugs that have reduced the effectiveness when given with oral contraceptives would be uh, beta blockers, warfarin, and talked about this one already, but tricyclic antidepressants, um, certain kinds of anti-convulsants, um, antidiabetic drugs, uh, theophylline, vitamins, and hypnotics. So osteoporosis is a major issue with mostly women, primarily 40% of them. Um, and we talk about this because this kind of goes hand in hand with um, menopause and in general women's health because again, women are more prone to osteoporosis. A lot of women who are of slender build, um, who have low bone mass, and there are, they are more prone to developing osteoporosis. So we have come up with a medication class that prevents ideally osteoporosis from occurring or slowing down the chances of osteoporosis in general. People who may be at more risk of developing osteoporosis than others would be people of Asian or European descent, talked about being a slender build, um, early estrogen deficiency, so developing obviously not enough estrogen at a, at a very early state rather than later in life. If they're a smoker, they drink a lot of alcohol, uh, don't have enough calcium in their diet, a very sedentary lifestyle, or if it is passing. So the doctors that I work with also use this method, but there is preventative methods. And what that means is they want to prevent it from occurring before it happens. So they're being proactive versus reactive. And a part of their uh, regimen is they get a lot of the women who are six years older on vitamin D and calcium supplements to really strengthen those bones and get them at their, you know, their best bone health that they can. Read over this question out loud. You can pause the video if you need to, and then we'll go over the answer. So if you chose answer B, you are correct. Remember that smoking should be avoided during estrogen therapy because it adds a risk for those clotting issues like thrombosis. So how do we treat osteoporosis once we've known that it's around or once we know that that's an active di diagnosis for a patient? So there are different classes. We're not gonna go through each one of these in detail. I do want you guys to spend some time on your own getting to know some of these medications. Some that are stand out to me will either be stand out for testing purposes or they will be stand out because I know you're going to give these in the real world. Um, Alendronate, which is called Fosamax, this is very common. The next one that's really common is Avista. And the last one that's really common that I've seen primarily for hormone replacement therapy is Calcitonin.
And just a quick review on those drug classes, biphosphates basically try to stop the osteoclast from occurring. And remember, osteoclast is essentially breakdown of bone. CIRMs, which is our selective estrogen receptor modulators, um, they actually stimulate estrogen and um, increase bone density. Some more medications that we will be using to treat osteoporosis. We have calcitonin, which I again said was a very uh, common medication you'll be giving. This is actually derived from um, fish, and it again kind of just helps with the um, bone resorption. We also have Forteo. This is the only drug that actually stimulates bone formation, and this is derived from a parathyroid hormone very similar to like an, a natural parathyroid hormone. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. With calcitonin, you may see this being given um, nasally or in an injectable form as well. Uh, prolia, uh, this is um, again blocking the breakdown of our bones, osteoclast, right? Um, hopefully again preventing the bone resorption. You can give this as a injection as well as um, giving it with a daily a calcium and vitamin D medication. So indications or uses for these different types of medications would be obviously to prevent osteoporosis um, and specific to postmenopausal osteoporosis. Remember, women um, over the age of 60, we want to start doing those preventative measurements. Lots of contraindications, um, things that probably stick out to me more than others, I would say, because some of these are, are pretty common, would be with our biphosphates, um, would be our esophageal dysfunction. Um, this could sometimes lead to GERD or uh, swallowing difficulties. You want to make sure that after you give this medication, you have the patient sit upright for 30 minutes for prevention of choking um, or aspiration risks. With the CIRMS medications, um, we want to make sure that, again, these medications are not putting the patient more at risk for bleeding issues because this stands out more than others, right? There's a huge thrombo thromboembolic disorder risk as well as um, pulmonary embolism. Because calcitonin is der uh, derived from fish, we want to make sure specific to salmon that there's no allergies. Um, and then with another medication, uh, denosumab, we want to make sure that the patient has adequate renal function and that there's no impairments um, or no infections present because those are contraindications. Other adverse effects for our CIRMs is going to be things that kind of sound and look very similar to um, menstruation slash postmenopausal um, adverse reactions such as hot flashes, um, going again back to the increased risk for um, thromboembolisms, um, tetragenic interactions, and leukopenia. Biphosphates, you're going to see here more of like your headache, GI issues, uh, joint pain. Um, esophageal burn, stomach issues, and then again, um, you could have bone joint or muscle pain, very severe. Calcitonin, this is again the one that's derived from fish. So you might see flushing in the face, nausea, diarrhea, um, decreased appetite, uh, which kind of goes hand in hand with the nausea and diarrhea. Most of us who feel nauseous or who have diarrhea don't typically have a very large appetite. Um, with our teriparatide, we have chest pains, dizziness, hypercalcemia, nausea, and anthralgia. Chest pain would probably stand out the most in because this could lead to something like a heart attack, which we know with some of these medications, we are more at risk for increased myocardial infarction. Infections with um, denosumab. Bosomax, which is a biphosphate, is something that we give to prevent bone loss. Uh, again, very common in the skilled nursing facility setting. We want to make sure that this is given in a controlled environment. The doses are given typically at the same time. This can be for men or women. Um, and this also helps treat um, Page disease in women. With Evista, which is a part of the CIRM medication class, um, this is particularly given to um, decrease postmenopausal osteoporosis and can cause hot flashes. So read this medication, or excuse me, read this question over to yourself. Pause the video if you need to, and we'll talk about the answer in just a moment. So if you chose answer D, biphosphates, you are correct. So biphosphates are to be taken exactly as prescribed. Remember, we should be giving them 
Around the same time every day as prescribed, the drug should be given at least 30 minutes before some of your patients have any of their food or drinks. Um, give it with a full glass of water around eight ounces. It's important, again, for them to stay upright for about 30 minutes to decrease any kind of esophageal issues, swallowing issues, or um, aspiration. All right, the next set of medications we're gonna be discussing, um, very vaguely, we, I don't wanna go into a lot of detail. There's a couple that will be standout medications. I think we should know a few things about, but this is a specialized area and you will, if you ever work in a fertility clinic or maybe a setting that offers, offers fertility uh, type medications, then you will get a lot of on the job training. Now these medications are important for you to know. Please review them over on your own time in the book. I will go over the ones that are more common or maybe one that you may see for testing purposes, but I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on each and every one of these because again, you guys, this is a specialty type of nursing. This is something that you don't need to have a lot of knowledge at once on, but you do need to understand how some of them work and really uh, when they're going to be appropriate when we see them, um, you know, in that kind of a setting. Okay, so fertility drugs are used ideally to increase the opportunity for a woman to be uh, pregnant, to increase their fertilization, to increase their ovulation, um, and then with the end result of actually conceiving and, um, you know, having a growing fetus. So one of the first types of fertility drugs I do want to go over in a little bit of detail with you is called Clomid. Um, now this is a non-steroidal ovulation stimulation medication. Okay, so it's a mouthful. Um, what happens with this medication is it actually blocks our estrogen receptors um, and it kind of gives us this uh, false signal of a low estrogen level. When that happens, our body will naturally increase the production of our gonadotropin-releasing hormones, such as our FSH and our LH. Now, if everything works appropriately and as it should, by increasing those levels, it's going to mature our ovaries, our follicles become stimulated, which will hopefully lead to an increased ovulation and increased chance of conception. Now, we have one called Pergonal, and this is a, a mixture of FSH and LH. Um, again, does um, promote stimulation of those ovarian follicles, hopefully leading to ovulation. This can actually be given to um, men as well to stimulate spermatogenesis. Abidrel is a recombinant form of the HCG, um, human chorionic gonadotropin hormone. Um, it can cause rupture and uh, ovulation of mature ovaries um, and essentially, um, you know, stimulate ovulation from, stimulate ovulation. <clears throat> the indications for this would be somebody who wants to um, obviously induce ovulation, um, you know, to promote spermatogenesis in infertile men and to increase their chances of becoming, um, you know, conceiving a child and becoming pregnant. There are many types of adverse effects that could occur. Things that kind of pop out to me more than others would be something that affects our heart, right? So tachycardia, um, we're at risk for deep vein thrombosis. Um, depression is a big one because mental illness, mental health factors are very important for women who are going through fertility issues and we wanna make sure that we are keeping their mental health in, um, in mind just as much as their physical health. And if they feel like they have any kind of a mental illness or you know, kind of a, um, an unstable, um, you know, mental state that we also are giving them help and treatment for that as well. The normal, I would say, quote unquote, because they may not be so normal for some people, the normal adverse effects could be things like flushing, dizziness, nausea, bloating, constipation, um, vomiting, or anorexia. Um, what can occur with this, which may be either a positive or a not positive adverse effect, would be multiple pregnancies. Um, and so some people end up, you know, having an increased, you know, uh, chance of uh, twins or triplets or even quadruplets with uh, some of our fertility drugs. Now, there's also uterine stimulants, which are different, and these medications are used to alter uterine contractions. We can use this to promote later labor or to start the progression of labor if they're not um, laboring naturally on their own. We also use this after birthing um, to reduce the risk of postpartum 
part of hemorrhage what this uh, these kind of medications do is just like the name of the title of them is they stimulate the uterus right and the more that they stimulate the uterus the more we can get that that fundus to be nice and firm we don't want to bog your uterus post delivery um, it increases the chance of blood clots and bleeding out so if we have a nice firm uterus which is why the nurse always comes in and massages it and presses down really well um, because it keeps kind of contracting right and and keeps the um, blood loss at a minimum All right, so we have um, certain kinds of medication uh, under this class, so oxytokics. We have oxytocin, which is a very common one, uh, prostaglandins, ergo derivatives, and then we have our progesterone, antagonist, mifeprestrone. So oxytocin, some of you may be familiar with this in the synthetic form. It helps induce labor, um, near full-term gestation, women who are essentially not progressing. Um, we also use oxytocin to promote um, milk ejection during lactation. Um, again, mentioned earlier, but we use this to prevent postpartum you know, hemorrhage by making sure that the uterine is contracting, keeping that uterus nice and firm. And they also use this to complete an incomplete abortion after a miscarriage. Prostaglandins, these are our natural hormones. Um, they cause contractions of our myometrium, um, which is those smooth muscle fibers in our uterus. Again, helps um, you know, induce labor. What it does is it softens the cervix and it enhances that uterine muscle tone to kind of create um, an easier opening, ideally, for a baby to pass through. We have ergo alkaloids, and these increase the force and frequency of those uterine contractions, trying to, again, try to speed up that process and get baby out. Um, it's used after delivery of the infant as well um, in the placenta to prevent uh, uterine hemorrhage, as mentioned before. Progesterone antagonist. Now, this is used to uh, stimulate uterine contractions to induce abortion. Um, this is given with the prostaglandin drug for elective abortions. There are many adverse effects when it comes to uterine stimulant medications. Um, you're wanting to watch out for major things like hypotension and hypertension, chest pain, again, because we said that this is very common to um, see with um, or it's very common when we see uh, chest pain that we need to watch out because we want to make sure that there isn't a, a myocardial infarction coming. Other um, maybe common adverse effects would be things like dizziness, fainting, leg cramps. Um, and then, of course, in the middle, we have our vaginal pain and cramping. And it depends on what this medication is being given for, but it is most likely going to be speeding up contractions, speeding up the labor process. And so those would be a little bit more natural. So this question is really hard to read because of um, this box here, but basically it's saying that um, a labor, a woman is in labor um, in an oxytocin infusion. The nurse states that her contractions are close to about 100 seconds apart and are lasting um, 1.25 seconds. The mother's blood pressure has increased to 130 over 98 and the fetal heart rate decreases during the contractions. The woman states, wow, this medicine is sure hurrying things along. What is the nurse's priority action? So you want to review all the answer options. And the answer is C. These are signs of hyperstimulation of the uterus from the oxytocin. So fetal compromise may occur if the infusion is not stopped or slowed down. Uh, tocolytic, so these are drugs for preterm labor management or uterine relaxant. So it does opposite of what we just learned. This is to stop labor or slow it down um, because we do not want women to go into labor um, with premature babies, right? This is generally used after 20 weeks of gestation um, when uterine contractions are occurring between the 20th and 37th week of gestation to, again, slow them down or stop birth. Um, there are non-pharmacological met methods that can be used as well, such as bed rest, sedation, and hydration. Endomethacin is a uterine relaxant. Uh, this is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agent. It um, inhibits prostaglandin activity. Um, Nifedipine is a calcium channel blocker, but can also inhibit myometrial activity by blocking calcium. 
Um, when indomethacin and nifedipine are um, ineffective and delivery is proceeding, corticosteroids are going to be given to enhance the lung maturity of the baby because um, babies or infants being born prematurely, the respiratory um, whole organ system is not matured. It hasn't um, been able to function properly. And so a lot of times uh, we risk preemies not being able to breathe on their own. And sometimes we have to, you know, intubate them and place tubes in them to get them to breathe properly in the NICU system. We do have herbal products that help with certain things. Um, and the first one we're going to talk about is soy. Now, soy can actually help relieve some of our menopausal symptoms and also osteoporosis prevention. Um, Estrazorb is applied as a lotion. There are adverse effects that can occur, such as nausea, diarrhea, abdominal pain, um, or certain types of um, uh, estrosorb skin issues. You know, how it stays on the skin for eight hours, so that could cause. So the nursing implications are based off of the medication classes that we've recently learned about. Um, in general, your implication should be take your assessment, including vital signs. Um, you know, what is their lifestyle like? Are they more sedentary or active? Uh, do they smoke or drink? You want to take a medication history. You want to take a past medical or surgical history. Um, any contraindications or adverse effects that they're experiencing now before they get on these medications, we want to pre-select and screen uh, for pregnancy tests. And the reason why we want to pre-select and pre-screen is because we cannot give certain medications to a woman who is already pregnant. Checking lots of lab values, making sure that not only is the pregnancy test negative, but how is their liver and kidney functioning? How's their hydration status? Before we would give any uterine stimulants, we want to make sure that we've assessed the mother's vital signs and the fetal heart rate. We don't want to uh, compromise the fetal heart rate and we don't want to put the mother in shock. We don't want to advance that labor too quickly. Um, again, reminding ourselves that uterine relaxants are used when premature labor occurs between the 20th and 37th week of gestation. Um, it's opposite of uterine stimulants, right? So when we have uterine stimulant, we want to make sure that we're assessing mother's vital signs because we don't want to speed up labor too much. When we're giving a, a uterine relaxant, we want to make sure that we are slowing it down purposefully because this, again, is preventing a preterm um, delivery um, of a preemie baby. When we are talking about our biphosphonates, we want to ensure that patients, again, don't have esophageal issues. So we want to keep them upright for at least 30 minutes, give it to them at the same time every day as doctor's orders. With our estrogen and progestins, we want to make sure that they give a small dose and then increase from there if needed. We can also decrease if the dose becomes too large. We can give this um, IM or orally, depending. Always want to rotate sites when it is an injectable. Um, we want to give the oral medications with the meal or snacks that we prevent GI issues and teach medications about self-administration, excuse me, teach patients about administration and what to do if they miss a dose. We want to make sure that they are aware of photosensitivity, so increasing their use of sunscreen, um, promoting, you know, either staying indoors or wearing, you know, clothing to cover up. Um, report any weight gain or loss to the provider, as this could be an indication of an adverse reaction. And then always make sure that they do their annual follow-up, including pap smears and breast exams. And then if there's like a quarterly checkup for the doctor's office, uh, that they're either calling in or going into that, um, that you know, checkup so that they can let them know about any adverse effects that they are experiencing. As always, we're encouraging that our patients are taking their medications as prescribed and only as prescribed. We want to monitor the patient and the fetus if it's applicable uh, during um, the therapy of this medication. This can include vital signs, uh, fetal heart rate monitors, um, obviously the mother's uh, vital signs as well, making sure that we're monitoring for blood pressure and uh, pulse ranges that they're at a normal range, checking for things like fever, um, uh, hyperventilation with some of the, the mothers who may be very anxious. This includes fertility drugs. Again, all medications should be taken as prescribed, plain and simple. Um, for people who are trying to become pregnant or conceive while taking these fertility medications, it's really important to keep a journal. We want to make sure that the patient knows when they're going to be ovulating. Um, and this could be kind of at the peak of their, uh, you know, uh, temp. You can do um, uh, test strips as well to see if you're going to be ovulating home, you know, home strips, uh, going into the doctors regularly, paying attention to their body's, um, you know, signs and symptoms of uh, ovulation. 
So again, reiterating with the biphosphonates, making sure they sit up for at least 30 minutes after the med. Give it with a full glass of water um, and give it on an empty stomach. For with SIRMS medication, um, this is something that we haven't mentioned yet. But we want to make sure that we are discontinuing these medications about 72 hours um, before any kind of a surgery or long trip because of the lack of mobility. Uh, we want to monitor always for any therapeutic responses. Is it positive? Is it negative? Are we more at risk or are we more beneficial, right? And that's something that we don't necessarily make the decision for the patient. They make that themselves or with their physician, but we should be taking note of all the adverse reactions that are occurring, right? We're monitoring for all types of adverse reactions, specifically the ones that we said were more life-threatening, right? So nausea and vomiting, yes. Right, that, that's uncomfortable, maybe make us not want to eat and lose weight. That's, you know, that's kind of, I would say, a moderate side effect. But when you have something like chest pain, uh, hypertension, that puts us way more at risk for, you know, worse risk factors at that point. So we really want to make sure we're monitoring for all adverse events. So last part of today's lecture, let's go ahead and read over our question and see what you guys think for your answer. And then you are done with your very last lecture. A woman has not taken her oral contraceptive since Monday. It is now Wednesday morning. What should she do now to prevent pregnancy? So keyword here is now. So read over the answer options. And if you chose D, you are correct. So missed doses will reduce the effectiveness of the oral contraceptive. So another form of pregnancy prevention will be needed. All right, everybody, that wraps up your very last lecture with me for Farm One. As always, I want to thank you for your time. I hope you guys have learned something in this class. I want to reiterate specifically for this chapter because I did a lot of skimming and just a little bit of uh, direct detail and content to read your book. Go over the um, objectives, go over the boxes in the book, and go over the summary at the end. Each one of these medications specific to you know, a patient's need, whether they're trying to prevent pregnancy or use fertility methods to get there, whether we're treating osteoporosis or uh, menopausal issues, whether we're starting contractions or slowing them, they're all very specific and on a case-by-case -case basis. So I highly encourage you to go back, again, reread over some of that stuff, um, you know, become acclimated and educated in, in some of those certain departments, and um, you know, just really give yourself some time to read over each section, and I know you guys will do just fine on your final. Thank you, everybody.